Good afternoon, everyone. It's Lisa Norell. It's Friday. Happy Friday to all of you. This is the Mindful Marketer live stream. And oh, I'm so glad that you chose to be part of this session today to kick off your weekend. My goal is to create and uh, generate with the help of our amazing guest today, some fresh ideas to help you not only be profitable and successful, but to do it mindfully. Well, before I introduce Alyssa Cohn today, I was uh, perusing the Wall Street Journal this morning. And, you know, this whole concept of entrepreneurship is a term that is used broadly. And now it's being used a lot with young people, with children. Uh, you've all, at least here in the United States, you've probably heard of Shark Tank and how it really cultivates entrepreneurship. But now, even on Disney Plus, we now have a show called Own the Room. So this was in today's Wall Street Journal. I think the timing of thinking like an entrepreneur is what really matters, not necessarily having to be an entrepreneur. And that's why I'm so excited here today to talk with Alyssa. So reminding everyone here that we'd love to know where you're from. So make sure you say hello in the chat. I'll be watching that, and so will Steph, my trusty producer today. So today we're going to be talking about how marketers can think like entrepreneurs, and we're going to really dive into what it means to be an entrepreneurial marketer and what are some of the qualities and behaviors and habits that it takes and then we're going to have a few predictions we're going to share with you. If you are in marketing or you work with marketing people or you want to become a CMO, then you have come to the right place today. So for all of you watching, also know that marketing is in my blood. And if some of you are looking for ways to really raise the game in your own profession as a marketer, uh, know that I not only love LinkedIn Live, but I also love being one of the LinkedIn Learning faculty members. So you can always go over to LinkedIn Learning and enjoy the library of courses. And we, one of my courses is the Effective CMO. So we'll uh, make sure that we show that in a little bit. So anyway, let's talk about our guest today. And uh, we're going to bring Alyssa Cohn in a moment to the room with me. She is freestyle rapper, Broadway investor, a writer, number one startup coach, as deemed by Thinkers 50, kettlebell queen, sassy New Yorker. Let's welcome Alyssa Cohn. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lisa. It's all true. It's all true. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's very difficult when I have these incredible friends join from the Marshall Goldsmith 100 Coaches community to be able to explain who they are. So I, I like to just pick some snippets. Cool. How is New York today? New York is finally sunny, beautiful. We're getting spring here. It's fantastic. Yeah. I'm so glad. And speaking of spring and warm weather, we also have Jacqueline joining us from South Florida. Hello, Jacqueline. Hello, Humble Jacqueline. Drag, South Florida, where the weather's beautiful all the time. Exactly. Exactly. So, um, Alyssa, we are going to be taking questions as we go through today. And right. one of the things that is always fun to do is to find out your origin story. Um, when, at, at what moment in your life did you realize, holy cow, I am an entrepreneur or I really want to be an entrepreneur? <laughs> well, first of all, thanks for having me, Lisa. And I may just say to everybody, one of the most well-regarded LinkedIn learning instructors, you should absolutely go check out all of Lisa's courses. Um, but the answer to your question is, I'm not sure if I had a sense of like, I want to be an entrepreneur, but I do remember working in a number of different companies and organizations. And I realized I don't know, like, I feel like I should be doing more for, I feel like I should be building a network. I feel like I should be selling myself. And I didn't quite know what that meant. I was like, what would you sell yourself to do? Because actually I didn't grow up around entre entrepreneurs. I didn't know about entrepreneurship. 
I just knew that I had more capacity than like a large company organization would be able to hold on to. And when I met a coach and I realized like, that's what I want to do. It was sort of the combination of all these things together. Oh, I want to run my own business. I see. Oh, I want to help people move forward faster. I see. And those things came together. Yes. And here you are now. Uh, you've had your firm for, is it really 20 years? 20 years, two decades. I know. I know. Welcome I to the it. two decades club. I know. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So what has been so far for you uh, as you've had 20 years to kind of reflect on what an entrepreneur truly is? Hmm. What definition would you give to our audience? Well, I think of entrepreneurs as the people who can peer over your shoulder to see a future that you don't see. So to kind of create that vision, to see that vision and to understand it in a way that other people may not. And then importantly, to marshal resources, one way or the other, time, energy. I'm a solo entrepreneur, but I work with a lot of entrepreneurs. And so, you know, who, who are running big, big businesses, they have to marshal people together. So it's the idea of in service of something bigger and better. And the last thing I would say is entrepreneurship happens within constraints because you always have limited people, limited finances, limited time. So you've got to think about how to focus your time and energy and your resources to get there within constraints. And I really like the constraints term. 90% of the chief marketing officers in our private cohort, as well as the ones that I advise and coach, tell me constantly, I have such limited resources. Yes, I have to launch a growth plan. I have revenue goals now from the CEO. Mm -hmm. And how am I going to get there when I don't have additional headcount right. to get to that next level? Right. So you bring up a key point there, you know, and, um, I like your definition. Mine plays off of that one, which is mm -hmm. it's someone who consistently turns possibility into profit. Mm, that's great. Because I, I don't know about you. I won't name names. Have you run across a lot of people that see tons of possibility, but don't really take action on any of them? Yeah, yeah every day. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I think I just want to distinguish for our audience, you know, there is quite a big difference between dreamers and entrepreneurs. Yes. So I, I, I'm just a fan here. You know, we're coming up on our one year anniversary with our life streams. And I am just such a big fan of Plato, who said the path to wisdom begins with a common set of definitions. So I just <laughs> I. I wanted to make sure that everyone understands kind of the container from which we're operating today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you've worked, you have worked personally with some of the world's most amazing entrepreneurs. Um, Mac Weldon is one of your clients, Dory mm -hmm. Clark, the entrepreneur extraordinaire. Mm -hmm. Marshall Goldsmith is mm -hmm. probably one of the best entrepreneurs I know. Yeah. Um, what have you seen among entrepreneurs that really that the qualities that they share in common? Well, a thousand percent persistence and resilience and the ability to put one foot in front of the other and the willing the willingness and ability to see obstacles as opportunities. Yes, persist. You know, that's one of the reasons that I reached out to you. I said I, I listened to a number of your podcasts and your mm -hmm. live streams as well. And I said, she's hitting on a nerve here is that persistence. How much did we hear the word no? And what all the things during COVID we were unable to do the things yeah. you cannot do yeah. for, for safety reasons or for funding, a lack of funding and other constraints. So yes. that persistence, when you, you talked about when you heard no from some publishers and you mm -hmm. persisted nonetheless. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, uh, I think what's one of my personal watchwords is persistence. And, you know, um, there's a quote that I always think about. It's actually from Og Mandino, the world's greatest salesman. That's what he's, that's what his title is. And he says, I will persist until I succeed 
every minute will I take another step? And that's kind of what I tell myself sometimes. And I think it's important for us all to have that quality and that ability, but it's not just blindly stepping. It's learning from the environment around you, stepping back, thinking about like, huh, how do I need to, to reposition or to tweak my process so that you're taking your efforts and making sure they're focusing on the outcome that you want. Other than not having a persistent mindset, mm -hmm. what behaviors or other environmental constraints have you noticed over the last year mm -hmm. that have prevented people with a marketing mindset from really navigating the pandemic? Well, I think, um, I just want to say that I feel I feel a lot of like compassion for all of us during this time. And to the extent that people have been weighed down with like family responsibilities and just real grief about the state of the world, I can really understand that. At the same time, I really think a lot about what's the opportunity here. So I was just um, be, for at some point uh, before it got too freezing cold, I was having dinner outside in New York with somebody. And she, also a marketer, was bemoaning all the sort of the tragedy and the difficulty that she had had and her family had had during the year. And all I said was, well, has there been anything that's shown up for you that has been a gift or an unexpected silver lining? And, you know, she's like, oh, I never thought of that. She even said, that's a question I ask other people but I haven't thought about it for myself. And so I think it's the ability to see everything as a possibility. And I think it's for that, that so the, the disinclination to do that being so weighed down that you don't think about what's the possibility here, what's the gift here, what's the silver lining, that I think has held a lot of people back. And I would also say this pandemic has really shown us that our traditional business models and way of doing business may be changing forever. And so I think it's important to accept that as quickly as you can, embrace that, and then figure out what is my personal advantage and my personal model going forward. Yes, talking about models, I mean, there for especially for those of you watching this, whether it be the live stream or the replay, a lot of marketing models are breaking down, and um, particularly in the way people in the past invested in search as a method of generating leads. Yeah. And so many of the algorithms and uh, the pay for, pay for leads models of Google and Facebook and others are being disrupted as we speak. And what types of business models or marketing systems are you seeing getting disrupted right now? I mean, I think the ones that you mentioned, um, I think also I would say sort of talk about the, the tie between marketing and, and sales. I think that relationship building has to change quite a bit in light of now that we're working remotely and uh, people have a different sense of their ability to be available. Um, I think that, I guess I would just step back and say from an entrepreneurship perspective, um, everything you thought was true about the way people work and the way people interact in the office and how you build culture, all of that is now up for grabs in, in terms of your ability as an entrepreneur or anybody to reinvent it. What are some of the ways you personally have shifted your marketing? I do remember from watching some of your videos and interviews that you are masterful at networking and you live in a city where networking and small private dinners and other gatherings are so easy to do. Yeah. So what's different now that you might actually end up keeping and continuing mm -hmm. to do post pandemic? Well, when the pandemic happened was sort of, you know, when the big massive lockdown in New York happened exactly one year ago today, pretty much. Um, oh. Yeah, I mean, this is the this is the year anniversary of New York, you know, really kind of shutting down, and um, everyone not even understanding, you know, the words lockdown, not even understanding what that meant. So, what I thought about as I was recognizing that the world as we knew it had been coming was going to come to an end for the moment, and we didn't know how long that was going to be. A lot of us thought just a couple of weeks. Um, 
the person you mentioned earlier, Dory Clark, my, my good friend and colleague, Dory Clark and I decided, well, we always do these gatherings over dinner, over drinks. We're just gonna start doing them over video. And so we adapted our model of gathering friends and friends of friends and colleagues, people we didn't even know very well together to do it over video. We've created a model where we have like, you know, approximately nine people per cocktail party. And we go around the room and we share uh, just, you know, introductions and bios. And then we go around the room and we answer a table question. So what we've discovered, so first of all, it, it goes without saying we all prefer to be in person. However, it's amazing how much intimacy you can create over a video, over <laughs> Zoom. And also we've discovered it's actually a lot quieter in the Zoom room, you know, so we can hear each other. So that's pretty cool. The other thing is that we can bring people from all over the world, not just all over the country, all over the world who have attended our cocktail parties because we can do them by video. And we've been able to continue meeting new people, making significant connections that we've kind of stayed in touch with and you know done business together and been friends together, even during a time where no one is really seeing each other in person. That's lovely. So how much do you think you'll continue doing that once New York and other major locations open up and fingers crossed we reach herd immunity? Right. Um, it's an interesting question. You know, I think that we've all learned also not to anticipate too far in advance right during this period. But I yes. would say we've gotten so much joy out of out of these events and we've been able to bring so many wonderful people together. I will say there'll be an additive, like added into our networking events right now. I know for myself, I wouldn't want to give them up because it's so nice to be able to convene people from even all over the world. So I think it'll be at now, everyone, the word of the year is now like hybrid, right? It'll be a hybrid approach. Um, and I think we'll begin to, we'll continue incorporating video and maybe other technology into our gatherings in the future. That's great. Well, I yeah. sure plan on it. Yeah. Because uh, I'm very fortunate in that I have clients and friends who live all over the world. Yeah. And um, that is the wonders of doubling down and investing in a studio. Yeah. And so it's it really once you get the sound in a place that is acceptable and is pleasant for others to hear you. Right. And you have a decent camera. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, game on. Bring it on. <laughs> Invite right. your friends. Right. Uh, so I, I think we've touched on a couple things. One is uh, avoiding over dependency on the, the big advertising platforms like Google yes. and Facebook for your outreach and your marketing. The second is getting creative with networking strategies. Mm -hmm. I think that's that's really a great one. Yeah. And are there any others that come to mind that you're seeing shifting either for your own business, which has grown and succeeded so well, mm -hmm. or with some of your clients who are larger, who might have a more dedicated marketing team? Well, there's no question. I mean, there's been a massive rise in social media and kind of personalized social media that I've seen my clients use. I think it's also, you know, there's interesting, the sub stack and really having a new um, sophistication about how to build an email list and how to create content that people are going to want and finding your niche audiences in those ways. I think, you know, sort of like relationship building using email, using a newsletter is gonna become increasingly <coughs> interesting. And I think also, you know, video is obviously something that people are experimenting with a lot and getting a lot of play with as well. Yes, I'm seeing the same thing. Um, I am in the throes of a study with mm -hmm. my partner, Michael Taylor, and we are looking at organizations that really do well at delivering good value to their potential customers and converting customers quickly and then keeping them. Right. And so we have been interviewing a number of leaders, CMOs, VP of growth and other people mm -hmm. around this topic. And they agree with you that with all of the changes going on on some of these big platforms and some of the things we've seen happening in Australia against Google and others, right. um, building your organic list yes. is really essential. It's yes. really essential and nurturing that list even before they become a customer. 
Yes. Um, I a quick story. And by the way, I want to remind everybody I'm here with Alyssa Cohn, the number one startup coach in the world. And this is a great time to be posting your questions. So make sure you share some questions and we'll get to those as well. Back on the organic growth of your list, um, there are a couple organizations that I heard about that people might want to start tracking who are helping companies in this particular area. One is a, an organization called DMI, that's Donald Mary Indigo, and they help people build their email list ethically. Mm -hmm. By the way, I had to put the word ethically in there. Yeah. Um, you know, they don't make up email names to help you build your list. And then the other one that uh, someone spoke very highly about is the International Media Association. Mm. So they recommended this. We we had a, a meeting this week with the head of growth for one of the world's largest print publications. And she was telling us about um, all the work she does now versus five years ago when she worked at USA Today, but all the steps they go through on the front end to not sell anything. <laughs> you know, they put 13 emails together over a 13 week period hmm. that they send out and none of them are pitching their services or their subscriptions or anything. Mm -hmm. It's strictly knowledge, information and value mm -hmm. with a little blurb on the bottom. If you'd like to subscribe, click here. Yeah. And I'm, I'm hoping Forbes is listening because if I see one more pop up on my screen from Forbes, you know, I'm going to scream and they, you know, it's just tamping down that pop up. Got to get it now, you know, sign up immediately to buy from me. You know, it's that calm, learn. I'm here to educate, inform and inspire. Mm -hmm. And then slowly they have seen their, um, their buy the, their percentage of people buying from that strategy increase significantly. It's been mm -hmm. very successful. Yeah, I that makes complete sense to me. And I would just say the first step of all selling is not to sell, right? <laughs> it's like the best, <sighs> best counterintuitive strategy there is. It really is. Mm -hmm. And so I, I thought I would pass that along because I, that could be a very big change. And Boy, what a great time to own an email marketing company of any sort. And um, companies like MailChimp and HubSpot yeah. and others uh, will thrive for many years to come, which is yeah. great. Yeah, for sure. Which is great. Mm -hmm. So um, what other things are you seeing among marketers that can really help them think more like entrepreneurs? What, what do you suggest or recommend as some strategies or uh, tools that would be helpful to them? Well, I would say about marketers, um, just like I would say about all professionals. So first of all, get really educated about your market, right? So again, the world is kind of changing. What I find in the companies I work in is there are two kinds of people, the people who are constantly learning, self-study, listening to webcasts, right? Watching videos, reading about their field, and they just know more. And then there are other people who, you know, just aren't building their skills. So it's like for everybody, the way to be an entrepreneur is to be curious, to be engaged, to be interested, to do the self-study, and then to be agile in implementing what you learn. So experimentation is massive in the world of entrepreneurship, thinking about minimum viable product, experimenting, what are we trying to learn? I think marketers can absolutely learn from that right now. The world is moving quickly. So it's a question of like, where can I fit in Think about the experiments you want to run and think about how you can be quick to ad adopt and ad adapt to new environments. Well, as a woman who's officially been um, divorced now for three years, I can say I am the queen of A-B testing. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, it's there. I'll, I'll try some new ways of uh you know, socializing or new ways of building community and some work, some don't. Yeah. I mean, I also look at um, how might I be using Clubhouse in the future, you know, the whole social mm -hmm. audio world. And I'm not sure I'll, ever, I'll really use it much, but I am still experimenting. 
I'm giving myself 60 days to see mm -hmm. how it goes. Mm -hmm. um, have you, what has been your experience in the world of social audio as a marketing strategy or an educational strategy? Um, I would say, so Clubhouse in particular has been, I think it's very useful. I think you have to figure out everyone with all these tools. And maybe this is another lesson for all of us. You got to pick your spots. You can experiment with many and then figure out what's going to work with me for in terms of all the tools available and specifically how I'm going to use this tool. So I think I've figured out a lot about how I'm going to use Clubhouse and how it makes sense for me. And in that sense, it's been massively successful. Well, we have a lot of um, people who follow us and many of them are entrepreneurs and run professional services firms as well. So that can be, you know, accountancies or coaching right. firms or supply chain experts. Um, how would you, how do you see yourself using Clubhouse as a coach? Well, I think that um, what's powerful, powerful about Clubhouse is that you can just step on the platform, no preparation, and you can gather an audience. And the more you spend some time and show up in rooms and get on the stage of you know, influential people, the more you can, um, what can I say? The, the more you'll be able to um, gather those followings mm -hmm. and be able to command a room when you walk into it. So I think that's very helpful. It's very helpful for people. And I think it's also, I, I would say for me, it gives me an opportunity to meet people that I haven't met before. And I think it gives me an opportunity as a coach to do really casual Q and A, which has been just really fun and rewarding. Well, I hope we also see the convergence of platforms where maybe LinkedIn Live teams up with Clubhouse and we can have these kinds of conversations on Clubhouse as well. Yeah. And it would be really fun to see how that works out in the next one to two years. Definitely. And well, there will be a convergence one way or the other. And we can cross pollinate because maybe while I'm driving, of course, safely with my Bluetooth turned on. I want to join a LinkedIn live and call in and ask a question and uh, come to the podium as opposed to having to type in my question. Oh, Bill is with us from Portland. Bill, welcome. It's great to see you. And um, it's, it's an exciting time. And Jeremiah Oyang, and I'm sure I am not saying his surname correctly, Jeremiah is someone I follow on Twitter, and I think he mentioned there are now 22 social audio platforms out there. Yeah, so it's it's explosive. Yeah, yeah. By the way, Jeremiah is also a kettlebell user. <laughs> yep, Jeremiah had a lot, long conversation about our kettlebell obsession. How does where on earth could he be storing his kettlebells? He, he's got an airstream that's about the size the of my desk. I know the secret that's actually his office, not his home. <laughs> oh I, I've well, seen his home, he's got the kettlebells in the home. <laughs> well, that's good to know. Yeah, I was worried there for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Oh my gosh, now I also want to tell a quick story. You you really cracked me up when I was, uh, of course, we follow each other on Facebook. I saw that you tran had kettlebells transported when you went on a retreat recently. Yes, that is true. Now talk about being an entrepreneur, a resourceful yeah. person. Yeah. Um, how many people transport kettlebells to another country for their retreat? <laughs> by the way, that did take a lot of resourcefulness. And also, by the way, uh, that to me is about commitment. Like I have to say, I was going to be in Mexico for four weeks. And then I realized, why should I go home? And I stayed for five <laughs> weeks. So, you know, for me, fitness is an important part of my life and an important part of my routine that helps keep me sane obviously fit in good shape. And also it's just part of my life. And to be away for that long and not have my tools with me, you know, I just thought, well, that's not good. And I thought to be away for that long and have my tools with me, that's better. So I just thought, well, what do I need to do to bring my tools with me? 
And so again, it, it took something. I'll say I don't say why it took it took a lot, but um, I was really happy to be the kind of person that can make hard things happen. Yes. And boy, I, I think I said to you a week or so ago, that is a perfect backdrop for a series of great blog posts and articles, or maybe your new book. Oh, speaking of books, tell us about the book you're working on. Oh, thank you. My book is called From Startup to Grown Up, Growing Your Leadership While Growing Your Business. And it has to do with the, the transition, the growth phase that you have to go through to become founder to CEO, someone who's building a product to someone who's building a business. And um, it is kind of my stories, my experiences working with various different founders as they move in that tr transition to CEO. That's great. And when can we all sign up and get notified or how can we all sign up and be notified about when the book launches? I know, well, the book is gonna launch in the fall and I'm not quite there for pre-orders yet. But um, you can always come to my website, alyssacone.com, and sign up for my newsletter list. And I promise you, you will hear quite a bit about that on my newsletter list. So thank you for asking. I'm very excited about it. And by the way, that's also a journey. Like when I first got this book contract, I was like, oh, I don't know how to write a book. <laughs> you know? And then, you know what I did? I started writing a book quite badly. And then as I was practicing writing a book, it got better. And now at the end of this process, I'm like, hey, I'm really excited about this book. This is gonna be a really good book. I can't wait to tell everybody about it. And at the beginning, I kind of thought, I'm not gonna tell them about this book. So I just wanna tell everybody, this is like, the, like my religion. You got to try, you got to keep going. Things that are easy, that are things that are hard to do are hard to do. They take practice. And I just know for myself, before I start my fitness session, if it's gonna run or do my kettlebells, I don't feel like it. I feel like it after. Before I was gonna write this book, as I started writing this book, I wrote it kind of badly until I got better at it. So it's it's there for all of us to perfect our skills. I also believe so much in the power of the written word. Yeah. And now that many of us, well, first of all, 90% of my CMO members in our private cohort do not plan on going back to five days a week in the office. Because mm. in the office, I can communicate with you and I, I can read your body language differently and feel your energy very differently than when I'm behind a screen or on Clubhouse. Yeah. And um, when that goes away, the power of the written word becomes even more palpable. Yeah. And so I think if for all of you watching, I think a marketing superpower that is more critical than ever is learning to be a good writer. Yeah, I totally agree. And I would add a good writer in casual situations, a good writer by email, a good writer by text, a good writer by Slack. And I think people don't pay enough attention to the way they're coming across on email or text. And um, I think it's, it's unfortunate because people get the wrong impression of you. Yes. Yes, it, it's very true. And it, it when I've written all of my books and all of my online courses, one thing I learned from that is I became much more masterful of my topic after I wrote about it. Totally. Yes. I think that's exactly so for right. all of you. So I uh, and I apologize. I stepped on you there for a minute. What did go ahead? Oh, no, I Alyssa. just agree. I agree. Yeah, it does. It is that way. Yes, and it, even if it means learning how to write a 100 word memo to your team before you meet with them one on one, it can be very restorative and powerful. Genevieve, thank you. Yes, I know I'll be enjoying that book very much when it is launched. So thank you for being here. And uh, yes, so closing thoughts. What, what do you think is the world is going to look like for marketers six to 12 months from now? Well, um, it's, it's, here's what I know. Here's what I know for sure. It's not going to look like it used to, and it's going to look like a, tr like six to 12 months is a transition time for all of us. So if I think about what that means, I would just come back to embracing what is happening, having agility in what you're learning 
and building a core and a, well, I wouldn't say core, but a key network around you of a, in a broad way of people who can sh share with you, Lisa, just like you're saying, my version of marketing from this, you know, at this time period, my version of marketing in this time period, you know, it's like you need to have fresh ideas and fresh perspectives. So you know what's going on out there so you can figure out how to pull your package together and then do great work from that point of view. Well said. And it's also very interesting. Um, I do my best to be to actually practice what I preach. And when I ask my CMOs, why do you continue to come back year over year to either work with me or to be part of our CMO cohort, uh, which is the marketing growth leaders community? And before COVID, they said, well, I want to get promoted mm -hmm. or I want to contribute more revenue to the organization because now I'm treated like an order taker versus an innovator. Mm. I said, okay. But then since COVID hit, the reasons they buy from me have shifted dramatically. Mm -hmm. the number one reason mm. I need to overcome isolation and loneliness. Mm. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm breathing my own exhaust. Mm. Mm -hmm. And, and then the second one is I want to contribute to the growth of the company, not be a services group as I don't want to be treated the way, unfortunately, sometimes HR gets treated. I want to be sitting around the growth table and contribute to the strategic direction of the organization. So um, I don't think that's going to change. I think loneliness is something that we're going to have to manage in new ways going forward. Yeah, yeah I agree with you. Mm -hmm. Well, I really, oh, and Aunt Allegra is with us and she says, oh, that is so true. So yes, Allegra, we're glad you're here as well. Well, it has become the bewitching hour, Alyssa. How again, uh, people can find you. There is a link that Steph has gone ahead and added so people can keep in touch with you. And I also think you have a masterclass coming out soon. Yes, thank you for asking. Our ma I'm doing this with Jory Clark and our masterclass is called Business Academy, Business Development Academy for Coaches. And it is, uh, we're in partnership with WBEX, which is the world's largest coach training organization to help elevate the field of professional coaches. And we're teaching people how to build their businesses, how to build a thriving coaching practice. Coming out of the pandemic, to your point about loneliness, people have been isolated. People have not known how to grow their businesses. At all times, coaches have trouble uh figuring out they don't they don't get really taught in like coach school you know sort of how to build their practices so dory and i are going to unlock the secrets of that and the first step is this master class where we're going to share five counterintuitive secrets um of us uh, of growing your business i can't wait um and i know i signed up for the introductory session because really? i would never i would never miss that i mean i've been coaching for <laughs> 20 years and okay. um I, I have trouble saying 20 years, but I, I think I should wear it proudly. I've been coaching for 20 years. I, I don't feel 20 years older, so that's good. <laughs> and um, and it's a new time, and I am like you. I love to learn, and uh, it's a great place to go to get that knowledge and that community. Thank you. Well, I look forward to seeing you there for sure. Come and say hi in the chat. And uh, we, I invite everybody to sign up. It's going to be, we have seven more sessions we're doing. So it's going to be good, good, uh, good TV. Well, Alyssa, it's great to see you. I hope you stay, you and your husband stay safe in New York. Thank and uh, we can't wait to have you come back when it's time for your book launch. Thank you so much, Lisa. I really appreciate the support. Thank you for showing our, our coaching clients how to get more coaching clients without feeling like you're selling. And uh, Lisa, it's great to be with you. I really always appreciate your, your time and your energy. It's my pleasure. Have a great weekend, Alyssa. Bye. Take care. Bye. Well, my friends, it's time for us to say goodbye for the day, for the weekend. And boy, I hope you took away as many great ideas from Alyssa as I did. We talked a lot about things that we can stop doing as marketers we talked about things that we have to think about, ways of being that are different going forward. And I think we came up with some good 
thoughts on how to design our businesses differently going forward and surround ourselves with great people to avoid isolation and loneliness. So I hope you'll join us again next week where another amazing Marshall Goldsmith 100 Coaches member will be with us, John Baldoni. And I want to remind everyone as uh, Steph shares with us the details on that, that a couple of things. One, John will be with us next week to talk about how to increase stakeholder engagement. And John is a 14 time author, and I know you will enjoy being there with us. And another quick thing, and I think Steph, if you're able to bring this up on the screen, um, you're always welcome to learn more, go deeper on how to be a mindful marketer by visiting LinkedIn Learning. They have a many thousands of courses, but more specifically, uh, feel free to take the course, The Effective CMO, to uh, really dive into what it takes to align and thrive as a marketer. So with that, I want to wish you all a great weekend and lead well, live safely, and stay mindful.